Jesus warned in Matthew chapter 7, verse 15, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. Furthermore, in speaking of the end times in Matthew chapter 24, verse 11, Jesus added, Then many false prophets will rise up and deceive many. Since Jesus gave such a strong warning about false prophets, it is vital for us to be able to identify who they are so we don't end up getting deceived by them and lost. And that's exactly what I'm going to be doing in this video as I present to you 7 Signs of False Prophets and Teachers. But before I do that, some of you have been messaging me to get advice about how to do successful YouTube evangelism. And I'm thinking about creating a course for that in the future. But in the meantime, I would like to tell you about a plugin that I use to help optimize my YouTube videos called TubeBuddy. I've been using TubeBuddy for several years now, and it has all kinds of tools to help you increase your views and subscribers on YouTube. Some of the ones I like include video A-B testing. How that works is, if you upload a video that is not performing so great, you can create a new title and thumbnail for it and use TubeBuddy's A-B testing feature to alternate those two titles and thumbnails to discover which one performs better. I use this quite a bit actually. Another tool I like is Click Magnet. This inspects different elements of your previous videos to see what drives more traffic so you can make similar videos in the future to increase your chances of success. For example, if I click on Element Inspector, right off the bat I can see the click-through rate of videos on my channel which have a face in the thumbnail compared to no face. And the ones that have a face have a much higher click-through rate than those that don't, indicating to me that I should make more thumbnails with faces for my future videos. Apparently, you guys like my face. Those are just two of the dozens of tools that TubeBuddy has to optimize your YouTube channel. Click on the affiliate link in the video description to visit TubeBuddy and choose a plan that suits your needs. By the way, I have the Legend plan, and that's the one I recommend. That's gonna give you access to A-B testing click magnet, and all kinds of other fun stuff. And if you sign up now, use the coupon code BFBOX at checkout to get a 20% discount on your subscription. Before I get into the signs of a false prophet, I just want to explain that the meaning of a prophet is someone who communicates directly with God and then shares God's messages with others. Prophets are mostly known for foretelling future events, but they also may call people to repentance, warn them of divine judgments, and exhort them to remain faithful to God, to name a few. One example of this is when the prophet Nathan rebuked King David for killing Uriah the Hittite in 2 Samuel chapter 12. A prophet can also be a teacher. For example, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 1 says, but there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you. But generally, the role of a teacher is to instruct others in understanding and applying the word of God. So a prophet and a teacher are distinct, but they can overlap if someone has both of these spiritual gifts. That's why the signs I'm about to present not only apply to false prophets, but to false teachers as well. Number one, their prophecies fail. One sure sign that someone is a false prophet is that their prophecies fail. Deuteronomy chapter 18 verse 22 says, When a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the thing does not happen or come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord has not spoken. The prophet has spoken it presumptuously. You shall not be afraid of him. Several major modern religious founders fall into this category. One of them is Charles Taze Russell founder of the Jehovah's Witnesses. An online post entitled Top 10 End of the World Prophecies, subtitled Jehovah's Witnesses, mentions a few of Russell's failed prophecies, stating, The onset of World War I freaked a lot of people out, but it was especially trippy for Zion's Watchtower Tract Society, a group that's now called Jehovah's Witnesses. The society's founder, Charles Taze Russell, had previously predicted Christ's invisible return in 1874, followed by anticipation of his second coming in 1914. When World War I broke out that year, Russell interpreted it as a sign of Armageddon, 
and the upcoming end of days, or as he called it, the end of Gentile times. History proved otherwise. There are currently over 8.5 million Jehovah's Witnesses around the world. Jesus wasn't kidding when he said false prophets would rise and deceive many. Then there's Joseph Smith, the founder of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Joseph Smith made numerous prophecies throughout his life that didn't come true. For example, he predicted that Jesus would return in 1890. In Doctrine and Covenants, which is a Mormon religious book containing the revelations of Joseph Smith, chapter 130, verses 14 through 15 states, I was once praying very earnestly to know the time of the coming of the Son of Man. When I heard a voice repeat the following, Joseph, my son, if thou livest until thou art eighty-five years old, thou shalt see the face of the Son of Man. Therefore let this suffice, and trouble me no more on this matter. Joseph Smith would have turned eighty-five in 1890. As we know, the year 1890 came, but Jesus didn't. Failure! There are currently over 17 million members of the Mormon Church worldwide. Number two, they proclaim a different gospel. This is fitting for the two false prophets I mentioned already, Charles Taze Russell and Joseph Smith, because the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormon concept of Jesus and the gospel are not biblical. For example, both the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons deny the Trinity, a fundamentally Christian doctrine. The doctrine of the Trinity teaches that there is one God, made up of three distinct but not separate persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, all of which are equally eternal and divine. This is derived from verses such as Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, where God said, Let us make man in our image according to our likeness. Us and our are plural terms indicating that God is more than one person. And speaking of Jesus, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things were made through Him, and without Him, nothing was made that was made. From eternity past, before anything was created, Christ coexisted with the Father. And all things were created through Him. In other words, He participated with the Father in the creation of the universe. And in terms of the Holy Spirit, Hebrews chapter 9, verse 14 calls Him the Eternal Spirit. And Acts chapter 5, verse 4 calls Him God. And the Holy Spirit has the characteristics of a person. For example, in John chapter 14, verse 26, Jesus said He will teach us and bring things to our remembrance. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 30, it says he can be grieved, so he has feelings. And in Romans chapter 8, verse 26, it says the Spirit makes intercession for us. However, the Jehovah's Witnesses teach that there is only one God, the Father. They claim that Jesus was created by the Father and is not divine, and the Holy Spirit is not a divine person, but God's act of force. Also, the Jehovah's Witnesses proclaim a false gospel. The Bible teaches us that we are saved by grace through faith. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 8 through 9 says, For by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Works play no part in helping us earn salvation. Rather, they are the evidence that we are saved. But the Jehovah's Witnesses teach a faith plus works-based system of salvation. An online post entitled, What is Salvation? by JW.org states, To gain salvation, you must exercise faith in Jesus and demonstrate that faith by obeying His commands. So faith and obedience is a requirement for salvation, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses. One of the works of obedience you have to perform in order to gain salvation, according to the Jehovah's Witnesses, is baptism. An online post entitled, Water Baptism's Connection with Salvation by JW.org states, Consequently, we can now appreciate that if we want to be saved, we must present ourselves for water baptism, in imitation of Jesus Christ and in obedience to His command. And the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is no better. They also deny the Trinity. 
Unlike most Christian denominations which believe in the Trinity as one God in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, Mormons believe in the Godhead as three distinct beings who are one in purpose, not one in substance. So to them, the Trinity is three separate gods, not one God in three persons. But if you thought that was bizarre, wait until I tell you about the doctrine of exaltation. The doctrine of exaltation teaches that after death, some Mormons will become gods, create worlds, and make spirit children over whom they will govern. Mormons believe that God the Father was once a mortal being who progressed to godhood and that human beings have the potential to do the same through the atonement of Jesus Christ and by following the teachings and ordinances of the LDS Church. An online post entitled Exaltation by the Church of Jesus Christ.org puts it this way Exaltation is eternal life, the kind of life God lives. He lives in great glory. He is perfect. He possesses all knowledge and all wisdom. He is the father of spirit children. He is a creator. We can become like our Heavenly Father. This is exaltation. If we prove faithful to the Lord, we will live in the highest degree of the celestial kingdom of heaven. We will become exalted to live with our Heavenly Father in eternal families. Exaltation is the greatest gift that Heavenly Father can give His children. In order to gain eternal life and reach the state of exaltation, Mormons are given a list of requirements to fulfill. Some of these include getting baptized, keeping the commandments, and attending church meetings regularly. Number 3. They Deny Jesus 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1 says, But there were also false prophets among the people, even as there will be false teachers among you, who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the Lord who bought them, and bring on themselves swift destruction. This is a good description of the prophet Muhammad, the founder of the religion of Islam. At around 610 AD, Muhammad claimed to have started receiving revelations from God through the angel Gabriel, which were later written down by his followers since he was illiterate and couldn't read or write himself, and Muhammad's revelations became the basis for the Quran. And surprise, surprise, the Quran rejects Jesus as the divine Son of God. For example, Surah al-Ikhlas 112 verses 1 through 4 reads, Say he is Allah, who is one, Allah, the eternal refuge. He neither begets nor is born, nor is there to him any equivalent. Allah is the Arabic word for God, and saying that he has no equivalent is a rejection of the divinity of Jesus. Jesus affirmed his divinity in John chapter 8, verse 58, when he said, Before Abraham was, I am. This is the same name God used to identify himself to Moses in the burning bush in Exodus chapter 3 verse 14, when he said, I am who I am. Not only does the Quran deny the divinity of Jesus, it also denies the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus. For example, Surah An-Nisa 4 verse 157 states, And for their saying, Indeed, we have killed the Messiah, Jesus, the son of Mary the messenger of Allah. And they did not kill him, nor did they crucify him, but another was made to resemble him to them. And indeed, those who differ over it are in doubt about it. They have no knowledge of it except the following of assumption, and they did not kill him for certain. Instead of Jesus dying on the cross, the Quran claims that another man took his place, making it only appear like Jesus was crucified. And since Jesus was not crucified according to the Quran, by implication, he was not resurrected either. Number 4. They Teach for Selfish Gain Speaking of false prophets and teachers, 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 3 says, By covetousness they will exploit you with deceptive words. Exploiting believers with deceptive words for covetous gain. This has prosperity gospel written all over it. Prosperity preachers deceive believers with the promise of wealth by manipulating scripture to claim that it is God's will for all believers to experience material prosperity and wealth. 
And in order to obtain that wealth, believers need to make tithes and donations to their churches. One common teaching in prosperity theology is seed faith giving. It suggests that believers need to sow a seed by giving money to the ministry with the exception that God will multiply this gift and return it many times over. Watch as prosperity preacher Richard Roberts explains this principle. I want to talk to you for a few minutes tonight on the subject, the laws of the harvest. The laws of the harvest. Reaping from what you sow. The Bible says in Proverbs 3, verse 9, Honor the Lord with thy substance and with the first fruit of all your increase. That's talking about sowing and sowing first. That's talking about giving and giving your best. Not reaching down, like I said this morning, off the bottom and taking something that you won't miss, but instead reaching off the top and giving him your best and then asking him for his best. He said he would multiply it back to some 30, some 60, some 100 fold. The only thing that's going to multiply 100 fold is Richard Roberts' bank account once all those seed faith donations come in. Prosperity preachers often quote 3 John verse 2 to support their theology, which states, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health, just as your soul prospers. They claim that the word prosper here means material wealth. However, the word prosper in this verse is actually translated from the Greek word euodo, which generally means to succeed or go well, but not always in material wealth. It's more likely referring to overall well-being and spiritual prosperity. God doesn't promise us that we would all be rich, like prosperity preacher Joel Osteen, who lives in a $16 million house and drives a Ferrari. But he does promise to provide for our needs. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, But seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. And although being rich is not a sin, if you have obtained your wealth honestly, riches are not a blessing to everyone. As a matter of fact, some people don't know how to manage their riches, and it ends up being the cause of their ruin. This happens to a lot of lotto winners, actually. An online post entitled, 23 Lottery Winners Who Lost Millions by GoBankingRates.com mentions the story of David Lee Edwards, stating, Five years after Kentucky resident David Lee Edwards won a $27 million jackpot, he was penniless and living in a storage shed with his wife. The couple squandered their fortune on the typical goodies that sink so many lucky winners. They bought dozens of high-end cars, mansions, and a plane. They blew through $3 million in the first three months. By the end of the first year, $12 million was in the wind. By 2006, the couple had spiraled into drug addiction. And just 12 years after the wind changed the course of his life, David Lee Edwards died alone and broke in hospice care at the age of 58. Real quick, if you're enjoying this video and would like to see more content like this from my channel, make sure to subscribe to my channel and click the bell so you get notified about my future uploads. I predict that you will not regret it. Number five, they perform miracles. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 24, for false Christ and false prophets will rise and show great signs and wonders to deceive if possible, even the elect. False prophets have miracle working power, but this power doesn't come from God, it comes from Satan. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 9 says, The coming of the lawless one is according to the working of Satan, with all power, signs, and lying wonders. Satan is a powerful spiritual being, so it should come as no surprise that he has some degree of miracle working power or the ability to counterfeit the miracles of God. And he grants this to false prophets to give credibility to their teachings and lead people astray. One example of this is Joseph Smith, the founder of the Mormon religion who I talked about earlier. He was credited with performing numerous miracles, including raising his father from his deathbed in October of 1835 and healing a large number of Mormons who had become sick in December of 1835. 
The way the devil accomplishes this, by the way, is he causes people to become ill. And then, when one of his agents pronounces healing upon them, Satan simply lifts the illness to make it appear like they were healed. In the last days, Satan will use his agents to perform a miracle so remarkable that it will deceive most of the world into accepting the mark of the beast. Revelation chapter 13 verses 13 through 14 states, He performs great signs so that he even makes fire come down from heaven on the earth in the sight of men. And he deceives those who dwell on the earth by those signs, which he was granted to do in the sight of the beast, telling those who dwell on the earth to make an image to the beast who was wounded by the sword and lived. He will call down fire from heaven. This is actually a counterfeit of the miracle God performed for the prophet Elijah on Mount Carmel when he had a face-off with the prophets of Baal in 1 Kings chapter 18. In order to avoid getting deceived by false prophets, you need to have a good understanding of the Bible and discernment of truth. God's word is the truth, and we should test the claims that professed prophets or religious teachers make about it. 1 John chapter 4 verse 1 tells us, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits whether they are of God, because many false prophets have gone out into the world. Number 6. They encourage false worship. Deuteronomy chapter 13 verses 1 through 4 says, If a prophet or one who foretells by dreams appears among you and announces to you a sign or wonder, and if the sign or wonder spoken of takes place, and the prophet says, Let us follow other gods, gods you have not known, and let us worship them, you must not listen to the words of that prophet or dreamer. The Lord your God is testing you to find out whether you love him with all your heart and with all your soul. It is the Lord your God you must follow and him you must revere. Keep his commands and obey him, serve him and hold fast to him. There's a lot of false worship being encouraged in the Christian church today. Religious leaders and Christian influencers are teaching their viewers to disregard one of God's commandments and worship in a way that is contrary to Scripture. What I'm talking about is the Sabbath. God commanded us to keep the Sabbath in Exodus chapter 20 verses 8 through 11, stating, Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work, you, nor your son, nor your daughter, nor your male servant, nor your female servant, nor your cattle, nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heavens and the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. That is the fourth commandment. God told us to remember the Sabbath, yet many Christian teachers and influencers today are telling us to forget about the Sabbath, claiming that it was only for the Jews or that it has been abolished. Here's a few clips from some popular Christian preachers and influencers talking about this. If Christians were supposed to keep the Sabbath, the ideal time for Scripture to have told us so would have been in Acts 15. If Christians should keep the Sabbath, the disciples need only to say, and remember to keep the Sabbath holy. Instead, they said the opposite, to whom we gave no such commandment. Sabbath day was there for people to rest, and it pointed to Jesus, who would be our eternal rest. Just like all the sacrifices pointed to Jesus, who would be our final eternal sacrifice for sin. Fact number five, the Old Testament law was given to the Jewish nation and not Gentiles. And this is one of the facts that many people overlook. The Bible says that the Sabbath was a sign between God and his people, which we know to be the Jews. And so there is no record in the Old Testament of Gentile nations, Gentile people, which includes you and I, observing the Sabbath or being judged for not doing so. I'm telling you, Saturday worship as far as the law is concerned, is a demonic doctrine. Everybody you just saw is a false teacher. False teachers twist the scriptures to justify not keeping the Sabbath. But Jesus was pretty clear about the enduring nature of the Ten Commandments in Matthew chapter 5, verses 18 through 19, when he said, For assuredly I say to you, till heaven and earth pass away, one jot 
or one tittle will by no means pass from the law till all is fulfilled. Whoever therefore breaks one of the least of these commandments and teaches men so shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does and teaches them, he shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. The same Christian teachers and preachers who say the Sabbath has been abolished almost always endorse Sunday in place of the Sabbath because Jesus was resurrected on a Sunday. But the Bible nowhere says Sunday is now a holy day or the Sabbath because of the resurrection. I dare you to try to find me one verse that says Sunday is holy and post it in the comments section. You can't do it. It's not in the Bible. Therefore, Sunday sacredness is a man-made tradition. And Jesus calls that vain worship in Mark chapter 7, verse 7, stating, And in vain they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. Vain worship means an empty or worthless form of worship because it's not based on God's commandments, but rather on human traditions and teachings. Number seven, they bear bad fruit. One dead giveaway that someone is a false prophet is their conduct, which the Bible calls fruit. Matthew chapter seven, verses 15 through 16 says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves, you will know them by their fruits. And speaking of the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 23 tells us, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such, there is no law. All of the self-proclaimed prophets that I have mentioned in this video have failed this test. For example, Joseph Smith had an insatiable lust for women. An online post entitled Mormon Church Admits founder Joseph Smith had up to 40 wives by NPR.org states, in an essay posted without fanfare to its website in late October, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints said for the first time that Joseph Smith, founder of the Mormon Church, had as many as 40 wives. Some of those women were also married to friends of his, and one was only 14 when she became Smith's wife. The name of that 14-year-old bride was Helen Marr Kimball. They were wed in 1843. Joseph Smith was 38 years old at that time. We have a word for that today, pedophilia. However, in Joseph Smith's defense, there were no laws prohibiting pedophilia in the mid-19th century. Nevertheless, the average age of marriage for women was between 20 to 22, and the average age gap between married men and women was around three years. Therefore, Joseph Smith's marriage to Helen Marr Kimball was not normal, even according to their standards. The Prophet Muhammad was not much better. He was not as lustful as Joseph Smith, but still managed to marry 11 women throughout his life. His first wife's name was Khadija bint Kuwailid, and they remained in a monogamous marriage for 25 years. But after she passed away, Muhammad began marrying multiple other women. But get this, the youngest wife of Muhammad was named Aisha bint Abu Bakr, and she was around six or seven years old when they got married. Muhammad is believed to have been in his early 50s at the time of their marriage. Gross. In terms of Charles Taze Russell, aside from his false prophecies, he was also a con man. An online post entitled Pastor Russell's Miracle Wheat Fraud and Deception in Watchtower Roots by alt.christian.narchive.com explains that Charles Taze Russell used the Watchtower to advertise Miracle Wheat to his followers for around $1 a pound, which was quite expensive in those days. He claimed that it would grow five times as much as any other brand of wheat. His followers were advised to purchase it and the proceeds would go to the Watchtower to be used in publishing the pastor's sermons. To make a long story short, a Brooklyn newspaper called the Daily Eagle exposed his scam and Charles Taze Russell sued them for libel, asking $100,000 in damages. Government departments investigated his miracle wheat and discovered it was low in the government tests and the Daily Eagle won the lawsuit. Big thanks to all of you who support my channel with your prayers and donations. Your support helps keep my channel going to reach more people with the gospel. Please continue praying for my channel. And if you'd like to make a donation to help me continue making high quality Christian videos, 
you can make a one-time PayPal donation or a monthly pledge on Patreon. Any amount is appreciated. You can find links to my PayPal and Patreon accounts in the video description. Jesus warned of false prophets to come, and the Bible gives us several characteristics to help us identify false prophets or teachers, including failed prophecies, proclaiming a different gospel, teaching for selfish gain, and encouraging false worship, to name a few. Don't just believe anyone who tells you they are a prophet or pretend to be an expert at teaching the Word of God. Put them to the test by comparing what they say and do to Scripture, because many false prophets and teachers exist today. Pastor Greg Locke of Global Vision Bible Church went on a rant in a video he posted to social media stating that Saturday worship is a demonic doctrine. I'm telling you, Saturday worship, as far as the law is concerned, is a demonic doctrine. He also claimed that Christians don't need to keep the Sabbath anymore because we are not under the law and Jesus is our Sabbath now. Click on the video which you see on the screen to watch his rant along with my response. If you enjoyed this video, please like it and share it to help spread God's word. Thank you for watching and God bless you.